Good morning, church. My name is David Gunger. I'm one of the pastors here at Good Shepherd. I'm going to lead us in this call to worship. Come walk in green pastures. We follow a shepherd. Come lie down in green pastures. We trust the shepherd. Come dine at the table of abundance. We are fed by the shepherd. Come dwell in God's house. We live in the shepherd's care. Loving shepherd, you know our names. You care for us. When we face darkness and death, walk beside us. When we hunger for your love, fill us with your presence. When we are fearful, feed us at your table. May we dwell in the house of goodness and mercy all the days of our lives. Amen. Let us sing together this morning. His love endures forever His love endures forever His love endures forever And it A thousand generations are as nothing in His sight like watches in the swift and silent night Though we should be as nothing in the journey of his day He makes us new each morning and he gives us grace to say His love
This tiny ship that carries me It is not yet But it will be So heaven come, it's you we need When I keep on Watch and pray Walk in the light of God's And now a reading from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Shepherd of goodness, your mercy has found us Here in green pastures where your kingdom grows Cleansed by the waters of new birth we offer Praise to your goodness that saves and restores Shepherd of goodness, your presence is with us When death's cold shadows seem too much to bear Those whom you call to provide for our comfort Point to your goodness through preaching and prayer Christ our good shepherd Lord, would you hear our prayers? Break open our imaginations. Lord, would you hear our prayers? 
Shepherd of goodness, your table invites us Bread for our hunger, a new cup of wine Nourished by grace, we can face opposition Led by your goodness and sovereign design Christ our good shepherd Shepherd, your love we extol. Christ, our good shepherd, Lord, would you hear our prayers? Break open our imaginations, Lord, would you hear our Lord, would you hear our prayers? Through the darkness, through the fire, through my wicked heart's desire, your love remains. Your love remains. Though I stumble, Though I falter through my weakness, you are strong, your love remains. Your love remains. Oh, my, my soul, it cries. Oh, my, my soul. Cries it, cries out. Through my failure, through my heartache, through my healing, in my pain, your love remains. Your love remains. Though I stumble, though I falter Through my weakness, you are strong Your love remains Your love remains Oh my My soul, it cries Cries it, cries out. Oh my, my soul it cries. Oh my, my soul it cries. Oh my. Soul, it cries, it cries, it cries out.
All are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class. Gender nor sexuality. Politics nor religion. Personality nor nationality. Count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos. Our hatred and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blows out into the world to listen and serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. For all are welcome at the table of God. Every man, woman, and child.
would you join me in this generosity prayer? Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasures that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May this be true of our community. Amen. And now, we invite you to share grace and peace with one another, to the people with you now, or perhaps send a message to those who are on your mind. Grace and peace to you. reading from the Gospel according to John chapter 10 verses 11 through 18. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning to you. My name is Michael Redzina, and I'm one of the pastors here at Good Shepherd New York. Before I offer my reflection on this text, I'd like to invite you into a moment of quiet. This is our way as a community of saying that these sacred moments aren't just about me doing what I do and you doing what you do, that there's another dynamic involved. In the Christian tradition, we open our sacred text. We hope for God's spirit to be guiding, speaking, inviting, nudging, comforting, and challenging us. And so for us, this moment of quiet is a moment of openness. And it doesn't matter who you are this morning. It doesn't matter how much faith or doubt you bring, joy or sorrow you bring. We simply invite you to bring your full self. And as best as you know how, open yourself to the creator and to your neighbor. So let's take that moment now, quiet moment. I encourage you to feel the parts of you that are closed right now, opening up with every inhale, welcoming new ways of being, new ways of thinking, opening new neural pathways. Imagine for a moment the kind of person that you want to be on this planet. Invite God's help toward that vision right now. And with every exhale, Simply let go of whatever you need to let go of today. God, be our guide, we pray. Amen. Well, my wife and I have four children, and when you tell people that in New York, they're bound to respond to you like you just broke the news that you have cancer. Right? There's this initial look of shock, followed by a look of sympathy, and then quickly followed up with something akin to, I'll be praying for you, or you can beat this. But with the experience of four children comes the experience of giving someone a name. Now, names can be powerful. Each of our children have a name that we put so much energy and thought and prayer into. But we learn pretty quickly with our first child that it's also a vulnerable thing to share the possibility of a baby name. We'd casually throw it out there for anyone interested the first time around. 
We'd even talk about different options that we were considering. And of course, it felt good when someone smiled or someone became excited or maybe shared a story of someone that they loved or admired who once shared that same name. But we were also met with other responses. Responses like uh, when, when we'd, they'd ask, what's the name? And we would respond uh, with the name and then they'd say, really? Or some would say, huh. And every once in a while, there was a look of disgust or horror that would come on someone's face. And then they'd share a story of someone who shared the name that we were considering, but that they didn't care for or even despised. My favorite was the ever neutral but teetering on critical response. Interesting. And so we made an executive decision after our first child. We wouldn't share the name of our baby until the baby was here. And what we found is that when that bundle of beautiful was cooing and staring through crinkled eyes and furrowed brows, that somehow, when the name was announced, it was received as nearly divine. Now, there's something primal about our names. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday, right? Churches all over the world are considering this powerful metaphor for God. And it also happens to be our name. A little over a year ago today, we changed the name of our church to Good Shepherd New York. And so I thought I'd take this opportunity to share why we embrace this new name, how it connects to our identity as a community, and also to our vision for life here in New York City, all rooted in Jesus' teaching from our gospel text. So I begin with the simple question, why the name Good Shepherd? Well, first of all, this metaphor is a refreshing contrast to the often harsh reality of our city. Right? New York is a pressure cooker. Right? The city fosters many traits in us over time. I've lived here for almost 10 years, and I can say it's profoundly shaped me, if in no other way in the willingness that I have had to be bold and forthright. Right? You have to learn that trait here to survive and to thrive. I've kicked taxi cabs as they came too close to my children. I've kicked rats as they scurried between construction sites to trash piles. I've told a person bluntly to stop eating food on the train. When I overheard a tour guide suggesting bottled water instead of New York tap water, I interrupted saying, hey, don't listen to him, New York's got the best tap water. And then I shook my head as I walked off, mumbling something like, what's the matter with these people? In short, I've become Larry David. <laughs> But the Good Shepherd metaphor is a much needed contrast to the hard edges that the city requires of us. It's a pastoral metaphor, one that could be really beautiful and open up possibilities for an urban environment. The truth is the church is at its best when it's pastoral. And when the church is pastoral, it focuses on concrete realities. How are things really, right? How are people really doing? It privileges people over ideas, people over issues, people over pretty much anything. Jesus did this all the time. You know, the Sabbath rolls around, a sacred day in the Hebrew imagination, and there's a response to that sacredness uh, that had built up, which was to regulate it, define work, define the limits of work, and be as specific as possible. But at several points, Jesus brushes these ideas aside. His disciples pick grain on the Sabbath, and the religious leaders freak out. He heals on the Sabbath, and again, the religious leaders freak out. Jesus has to recenter the debate, and he does so in a pastoral way. He says, quote, the Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. In that pithy comment, Jesus gives us a paradigm for pastoral instincts. Right? There are so many great things in the world, but they are great in as much as they support human flourishing. If something, no matter how great it is, begins to get in the way of flourishing, or worse, begins to damage that flourishing, then it's time to re-examine, to reimagine. Our ideas are a great example. You know, ideas, they matter, they have consequences, but if somehow a culture around the purity of an idea begins to hurt or damage people, it's time to rethink the idea or our relationship to the idea. This is why I love pastoral theology. It builds a vision of God and life from the ground up, so to speak. Taking the Bible, taking tradition, yes, and listening deeply to both, but also acknowledging the importance and the inevitability 
of our experience as the primal filter. There's so much possibility when it comes to this pastoral metaphor for life. I'll share with you three. The first possibility that excites me is being able to transcend transactional relationships. Right? This city can foster relationships that are purely transactional. In our gospel text, we learn that the good shepherd cares, that the good shepherd makes sacrifices even. But there's another character here that Jesus mentions, the hired hand. And the most important thing to observe about the hired hand is that they are, well, hired. Right? Their care is artificial. Their care is self-referential and self-interested. New York can do that to relationships, or perhaps it can shape us into people that approach relationships in that way. We live, after all, in the holy land of networking culture. Now, I'm not hating on networking, right? It's so important to this city, and we all have to be engaged in it. But this is a reality that's not going anywhere. So let's be realistic. Let's get pastoral, not theoretical about it. First of all, networking will not give you roots, right? It will not give you the safety net when your life falls apart. It cannot heal your soul, and it cannot transform you in the way of love. In New York, we're often haunted by the question, are people into me because of blank? Right? We're called Good Shepherd because we believe that the possibility of the church to transcend social boundaries is staggering. In this city, you need a community that can walk with you in those moments when others will bail, when others would cancel, when others would ghost, when others would disappear. Do you have relationships that transcend self-interest? Relationships that can speak the truth, that can listen earnestly, that are committed to you, come high or low? Are you the kind of person that can transcend self-interest yourself? You know, our name moves us in that direction. Now, the second possibility that excites me is the possibility of intimacy in a city of anonymity and isolation. Right? This city can foster anonymity and isolation like no place else. It's in this context that we need to hear deeply Jesus' words in this text. Quote, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Intimacy is at the heart of everything. Jesus talked a lot about it. He mentions eternal life, and he talks about eternal life in terms of intimacy. He says in John 17, this is eternal life, that they know you, O God, and me, whom you've sent. See, life is about knowing and being known. And what makes life sing is not when we're merely known, but when we are known and embraced, known and loved, known and accepted. The city breeds meritocracy. Everyone flexing the resume virtues. Everyone faking until making. Everyone in cell mode or brand mode 24-7. Where can you let your guard down? Right? Where can you take your armor off? Where can you be known? This is one reason our contemplative approach is so important. We need silence. We need stillness. We need solitude to be with God, to be with ourselves, and to be with others in a way that's curious and open, and learning, and mutual. This city and our lives in it get stuck in the flexing and the frenzy. The pace is incredible, and we need to learn how to slow down, how to pay attention, how to make space for people to know them and to be known ourselves. We respond to people here. We're dazzled by people here in this city. We perform for people here, but rarely are we known. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. The shepherd speaks into a profound receptivity. And we hope as a church that we can be a receptive community that grows in intimacy rather than falling into the trap of isolation. Finally, I think the possibility of inclusion over tribal behavior is staggering. The city, though often looked upon politically as a beacon of inclusion, can foster relationships that are tribal like the best of them. The city is extremely stratified economically. It's increasingly gentrified. Alec Baldwin coyly put it, every day Manhattan is becoming more like Beverly Hills. There's the tribe of the accomplished. Exclusive circles, exclusive access, exclusive experiences. Exclusivity is the currency in a city that's short on property and stuff. We can become insular politically, assuming the city is a monolith. 
It's here that Eric Garner was killed. It's here that an Asian lady was kicked and beaten in front of bystanders who would not intervene. For all the protests and the marches and the good policies that have been enacted around race here, there is still a deep racism at work. We assume because our city is diverse that we're inclusive, but we must not mistake proximity to difference as the same thing as inclusion. HBO did a documentary about our neighborhood where this church exists, and it was called Class Divide. It followed the lives of two communities that have little to no interaction with each other, though they're only across the street. In a city and in a world that nourishes that tribal human instinct, Jesus says, quote, I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen, end quote. We live in a moment of polarizing purity codes. I grew up in the religious South. I knew purity codes pretty well. It's where shame and disgust thrive. It's a place where nonconformity requires separation. What's been surprising to me is the way that this has arisen in other social modes, even in cities, liberal cities. There are new sins, new orthodoxies, new heretics, new exclusive institutions and communities. In a culture of polarizing purity codes on the right and the left, religious and irreligious, our church is all about expanding the we. In Jesus' teaching here, it is the wolves that scatter and the good shepherds that gather. There are so many leaders and communities that scatter us, that fracture us, that solidify the lines that separate us. Our church seeks to cultivate a listening and receptivity beyond our flock, beyond our tribe, We want that sense of larger solidarity that dissolves the easy us versus them ways of viewing the world and relating to the world. We want to practically break that down. But all this requires sacrifice. Jesus says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If we realize the possibility of this metaphor in this city, or this country for that matter, we'll need to make some deep commitments. This language of laying down life, it's not about a morbid goal. It's about a deep commitment to a central goal. Jesus doesn't aim to die. He aims for life. He aims for intimacy. He aims for relationships that are mutual, not transactional. He aims for a solidarity beyond tribal lines. And he's so committed to that, so committed to that direction, that he's willing to sacrifice himself for it. Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to lay your life down to experience the kind of life here in New York? What sacrifices are you willing to make as you consider this metaphor of what it means to be pastoral, to follow the Good Shepherd in a place like New York City? May God's Spirit give us grace and power and courage to move closer and closer to what Jesus paints for us here in this teaching about the Good Shepherd And may we, as a community, be a beacon of light and respite and rest for those who are bent low by the hurry and the flex of this great city. Amen. And now, having heard our uh, reflection on the gospel, we take a moment to say the Apostles' Creed. Would you join me in this? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now that we've declared our faith, we offer our prayers together. These are the prayers of the people, and we invite you to join your faith in this moment, to open your heart to God, and let's pray for our world, for the suffering, for the church, and for ourselves. And now, join me as we pray the prayers of the people. O God, you have filled your people with the Spirit, who rested first upon Christ 
and united us in your church. Open the channels for your spirit that we may freely work together, especially among those with whom we struggle in our local church, among other churches with whom we struggle, among other denominations with whom we struggle, among other religions and groups with whom we struggle. And through this benevolence, may your kingdom increase for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, it is your will to hold both heaven and earth in a single peace. Let the design of your great love shine on the waste of our wraths and our sorrows and give peace to your church. Peace among nations, peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts. O oh God, you rested on the seventh day and are still at work. In the course of our busy lives, give us times of refreshment and peace, and grant that we may so use our leisure to rebuild our bodies and renew our minds, that our spirits may be opened to the goodness of your creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed are you, God of the universe. You have created us and given us life. Blessed are you, God of the planet Earth. You have set our world like a radiant jewel in the heavens and filled it with action, beauty, suffering, struggle, and with hope. Blessed are you, God of the United States of America, in all the peoples who live here, in all the lessons we have learned, in all that remains for us to do. Blessed are you because you include us, because you make us worthwhile, because you give us people to love and work to do for your universe, for your world, and for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you dwell in the high and holy place of every heart bent low by pain. We pray that you would lift the hearts bent low by gun violence. We pray that you would lift the hearts bent low by racism. We pray that you would lift the hearts of those bent low by greed. We pray that you would lift the hearts of those bent low by exclusion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And now that we've prayed our prayers, we make space for confession. Confession of sin is simply an opportunity to take responsibility for the ways that we fall short of love. And it's an act of introspection and memory. And so right now, we invite you to consider the week behind you. And in an act of holy memory, simply hold a, a moment, a memory, where you fell short of love before God and before one another. And then feel yourself pivot away from it to take responsibility for it. And this is what the Bible calls repentance. It's the heart of meaningful change. Um, so would you join me in this act of holy memory? As the memory is coming to the surface, surface of your mind and your heart, we simply invite you to pivot away from it Imagine a different way forward. But most importantly, know that you're not alone. And so we join together in an act of confession. Would you join me in this corporate confession? Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now hear this word of forgiveness, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward you. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. You are loved, you are included, 
and you're forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we come to the table that Jesus pointed us toward, the meal he gave us, which we call Holy Communion. And as we enter into this meal, we begin with gratitude. Would you join me in this ancient prayer? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is good and beautiful to say thank you. And so right now we pause. We thank you for the good gifts of our lives. And we especially thank you for Jesus Christ, the gift of his life and death and resurrection, for how you who are love are revealed there. Our voice, our praise, our thanks ascends to you with the angels and the archangels of Isaiah's vision who cry out, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. And we pray right now that the bread and cup that we hold before us would become to us and for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit and according to your word. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and cup and he blessed them. He gave them to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this uh, body broken and given, and we pray that we ourselves would be broken and given for our neighbor and for our world. Amen. Likewise, Jesus took the cup, and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this cup is the cup of a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this cup, which speaks a better word than our retaliation and violence, and instead points us to your peace and to the forgiveness that makes that peace possible. And so we pray this cup would be ingrained in our, our minds and hearts this week as we face our conflicts, as we face our divisions. May this cup speak a better word. Amen. And now we declare the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now, friends, we receive Holy Communion. Our practice is intinction, which is taking the bread and dipping it in the cup and simply saying, thanks be to God. And if you're wondering if this meal is for you, we do practice an open table, which means any drawn to the love they see in Christ are most welcome to receive the bread and the cup. Let this be a gesture of your open heart toward the love that you find there. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Digital Church, once, more, once again at Good Shepherd New York. Um, it is really a, a beautiful season right now in the city. Uh, the flowers are in bloom. Spring is upon us. And we've begun meeting outdoors, in person. Uh, we hope that you'll encourage, or that you'll, you'll come and join us. You'll encourage your friends to also join us if you live in the city. Um, I, I believe that today's gathering is canceled, uh, at least at the time of this taping. The forecast is 99% rain. So, um, it, you know, we will be canceling in the case of bad weather. Uh, but... We hope for good weather, we pray for good weather, and we hope to have many outdoor gatherings over the course of the spring. Uh, those take place every Sunday at 10 a.m. here on the campus at General Theological Seminary. And uh, it's the, the first one that we did last week was beautiful. Uh, the, you know, the chairs were filled, we had blankets strewn out, kids were sort of wandering everywhere. Um, it was really beautiful. Um, so we look forward to more and more of that in the near future. I have a really uh, exciting announcement today about a new hire. Uh, we are hiring a part-time uh, pastor of spiritual direction, and we're hi we've hired Kate Gunger to fulfill that role. Um, so if you get a chance, uh, shoot Kate a note, uh, congratulate her, welcome her uh, to our staff. Um, Kate has already been so involved uh, in our church uh, as serving on our elder board, uh, occasionally preaching, uh, curating and leading our Wednesday night gatherings, offering spiritual direction to our community, and many, many other things. 
Uh, and so it's so exciting for us on the aftermath of her graduation, uh, getting her, earning her master's degree uh, here at General Seminary, that we would have the opportunity to uh, learn and grow under her guidance and care. Um, so we look forward to uh, her leadership and her tenure at our church. Uh, finally, I want to share with you that we will have groups beginning in the month of May, the last through June, uh, up to the, the summer. And if you're interested in leading a group or facilitating a group, please reach out to us and let us know. Uh, we'd like to offer a training for any group leaders that haven't been trained. Uh, and we especially are looking for uh, New York facilitators to facilitate groups uh, for New Yorkers. Uh, those can be digital, they can be in person, but in either case, uh, we have had a, a sort of outpouring of desire uh, for especially people who are new to our community or have joined us through the pandemic, but also live in the city, uh, to get connected, uh, to have uh, real friendships and, and spiritual companionship uh, here in the city. So if that's you and you feel that nudge, reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to, to assist you, to talk it through with you, and to, uh, to train you uh, for facilitating that experience. And now, receive this benediction. Nourished by the shepherd's abundant love, go forth to walk in the paths of righteousness. Love one another in truth and in action. May God's abundant blessings abide in you forever. Go in peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go in peace. There's a dying voice within me Reaching out somewhere Toiling in the danger And in the morals of despair Don't have the inclination To look back on any mistake Like Cain, I now behold this chain Of events that I must break in the fury of the moment, I can see the master's hand in every leaf that trembles and in every grain of sand. Oh, the flowers of indulgence and the weeds of yesteryear. Like criminals, they choke a breath of conscious and cheer. The Sunday down upon the steps of time to light the way to ease the pain of idleness and the memory of decay. I gaze into the doorways of temptation's angry flame. And every time I pass the way, I always hear my name. Then onward in my journey, I've come to understand that every hair is numbered like every grain of sand. I have gone from rags to riches In the sorrow of the night In the 
finds her a summer street in the chill of a wintry light, in the bitter dance of loneliness, fading into space, in the broken mirror of innocence, on each forgotten face, I hear the ancient footsteps like motion Sometimes I turn the sunday of the times it's only me. I am hanging in the bounds of the reality of me, like every spell falling, like every grain of sand. 